Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Garden Life Sunday Show. I am so happy you are here in the heat <laughs> to hang out with me. Today, it's all about answering your questions, some very specific ones, and then some overarching topics that I get lots of questions about, starting out with, how do I water? And even before this introduction is complete, Stuart, I'm gonna ask my question of the day. If you have any watering tips that you want to share, because temperatures are now hitting the century mark all over the country, and if you have any water-wise tips for us, please make sure to comment below. If you are not subscribing, please make sure to hit the subscribe button, like this post, share this post. <laughs> Is there anything else I'm forgetting? I think Stuart? you got it. I think we got that. Okay, so let's just get on with the show. I think there's some kind of, uh, oh, I don't know, points of argument about when is the best time to water. For me, definitely the best time to water is first thing in the morning or as soon as I can in the morning. The problem, I think, with the, with the hot temperatures in summer is that we want to get everything done in the morning. We want to get our exercise in. We want to get our watering in. It's at least for me, Stuart and I were talking about the fact that it's when we're most uh, mentally energetic, energetic. And so I think it's sometimes difficult, but it's worth getting up maybe 15 minutes earlier, I think, to get your water watering in. Now, how and when do I water? So the when, as I said, I try to water in the evening or in the morning. If I have to water in the evening, then I can. It kind of just depends on whether or not stuff is looking droopy. Typically, when it's this hot and it hasn't rained, I water some of my pots, not all of them, but some of my pots every day. I do have an in-ground irrigation system that is controlled by a sprinkler box over here. Now, on this one, my antiquated sprinkler system at my old house did not have a, a, a moisture sensor on it, a rain sensor, but this one does. So if it rains a lot, even if I have it set on auto, it will not come on. That said, every other day in Oklahoma, I don't, is it this way in Midwest City, Stuart? We're on permanent water rationing. So I we, think so. Okay, so we can only water with an automated sprinkler system. Whether it's one like this one that is an in-ground sprinkler system or it's even one where you attach your hose to any one of those kind of rotating, revolving um, sprinklers that you attach to your hose. Even those, if it is not your day to water, you cannot use them. So I am on the odd side of the street, and so the odd days are when I can water. On those odd days, I have very little watering to do because most of my pots, most of my large containers do have dedicated drip heads in them, and then obviously, all of the different kinds of irrigation that I have in the ground, those come on automatically according to preset times that I can adjust according to the weather. Typically in the spring, I don't put my sprinkler system on auto at all. I just turn it on when it's absolutely necessary. And really recently we've gotten so much rain mm -hmm. that I only turn it on auto uh, sporadically, but I think Mother Nature is going to turn off the faucet, so I'm going to put it back on auto so that it automatically comes on every other day. Now, what things do I water by hand and how do I do it? Well, I think I told you that this, it, I cannot believe how good this hose is. It gets great reviews online, and because of it, I just, I do love it. It's sincerely truly, really does not kink, which is just an unbelievable thing. It really, truly, sincerely well, I got a question about is it. lightweight. I, um, I kind of, you know, I step 
on it. I mean, if I'm just being honest, I'm walking backwards. I kind yeah. of step on it. It doesn't seem like I'm going to hurt it as much. You I, don't. I, no, you don't. Okay, you good. don't. <laughs> you don't hurt it. I don't it. put pressure on it. I try to lift up, but still. <laughs> it has not punctured. I noticed the other day when the guys were doing some work in the back that they left the water pressure on and the valve open at at the va at the uh, water spigot, and even that additional pressure in in no way compromised the integrity of the hose. So I think it's just tougher. The only downside is, yes, just like your rubber hose, if you leave it out, it will get hot. And when it's very, very hot outside, then the temperature of the water inside the hose also will be hotter, which is another argument for watering in the cool of the day when that's not an issue. I do keep it coiled up in a big black tub that's kind of hidden in the back. And it is it has just made my life so much easier. You may ask me, do I still like those giraffe auto auto wind hose reels? And yes, I do, but I really can't hang one of those on the wall here. And I have found this to be really just as convenient, just as practical, and in some ways a little more rugged. So that's that about my, my review on the hose. Of course, if you go to my Amazon shop or my online shop, you'll see that I always have a link to this hose because I am that enthusiastic about it. But of course, we will put a link in, um, in today's video. So the other thing is, you will ask me, do I have mist heads? Do I have drip irrigation? What do I have? And I've mentioned this before, but I think it bears repeating for those of you that may be new to the channel. And if you are, make sure to hit the subscribe <laughs> button. You know the, real, the, the drill. Um, in some areas, I have drip irrigation, primarily up in here and down the west side where those hollies are. So I've got drip irrigation in here with some dedicated bubblers to very specific things. So because I want the trees to get established and very quickly, there's a dedicated bubbler to each one of the trees and a dedicated bubbler to the hollies. On these bubblers, let me show you over here. On these bubblers, I can take a screwdriver. I'm not gonna turn it on now because I don't think it's my day to water. Um, but I can adjust the flow of the water coming out of these bubblers. So you see right here, Stuart, this is what's called a bubbler and it waters it where plants want to be watered right at the root zone. And I can turn the amount of water, I can adjust the amount of water that comes out just by adjusting this screw. That's something I can do myself. It's not something I have to have anyone help me with. Over here is a mist head. And a mist head, it is oriented so that it shoots all of this way, kind of at a low angle to get underneath the foliage of these gorgeous, I have to point them out, look at that white wanting hydrangea, look at the size of the flowers on those and all of the new buds. That, that is just unbelievable to me. That's what this is. This is this is a combo of those things. It does require a little bit of monitoring initially to make sure that you get those set at just the right setting, but I think it's worth the investment of time. Now you'll notice in here that I have some drip line that comes up and goes into these pots. I can also adjust the setting and the amount of water that comes out of these. These, I know I can come up, just um, as a point, uh, a little tip, I can come up through the drainage hole in the pot with these if I want to so that they are camouflaged. I can do that on all of them. But you know, I'm not sure that these pots are gonna stay here forever, so it doesn't bother me. These pots are in the back of my landscape, so you really don't see these black drip lines. They are not real in your face. They're not real obvious. The other thing is, is if I am having a garden tour or something like that where I know people will be up close and personal with my garden, I can always take these out and just hide them. So I like the flexibility of that. 
Um, in my other house, I did not have any kind of dedicated drip line to these larger pots, but here I do. Some of the pots, however, do not have dedicated drip lines, and those are the ones that I water pretty much on a daily basis. So these do not have drip lines. Why? Because I don't want the drip line to show. This is a very, very prominent place in the totality of my landscape. And this is a tip I remember showing Stuart. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of overwatering this a little bit. Let's come over here so I can, I can demonstrate. So when you water, you don't want to water like this because all that's doing is getting the foliage wet. Again, where we want to water is at the root zone. So I make sure that I really get down to the surface of the soil in the pot and not only do I do it in the front, I make sure that I get the guys in the back too. Because when plants and pots are as profuse and overgrown as these are in a beautiful way, then I want to make sure that I go 360 all around the pot to get it watered. And I pretty much wait until water is starting to come out of the bottom of the pot to make sure that I am, I am getting enough very necessary moisture to the root zone. I typically, some people I know say they have to water multiple times a day their container plantings. I don't. I just water them once a day unless it's a very tiny pot and it doesn't hold a lot of water. Now that's another tip. Make sure you have a large container because the larger con the container, the less frequently you will have to water. Case in point, these topiaries that I have up here on the porch, I typically do not water these every day. I haven't watered them for a while. So I'm going to do that. If I do water them at the top like this, it's because I might want to try washing off some spider mite or washing off some pests or just cleaning up the foliage if it's been particularly windy. And I'm going to do the same to this one here. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to do the same thing to my yoga mat, <laughs> which I just pulled out of the garage and I thought I'm going to put it up here while I do my watering so I can clean it at the same time and this one. Now I do not water these every day. One thing about this time of year when you water this much is because you are watering so much you are very much leaching out the nutrients, uh, the vitamins, that kind of thing that's present in the soil. So when it is cool enough cool enough, you may need, if you're watering more frequently and if it's raining more frequently, you might want to fertilize more frequently because again, all those nutrients are leaching out that much faster. This time of year, I may be watering uh, some of my really tough annual pots like those in the front urns because those flowers are really tough and can handle the heat, but things that are already stressed just by virtue of the fact that it's so hot um, and they're receiving so much sun, in that case then I will not fertilize those. Does that make sense, Stuart? It does. Okay, so let's come over here. Typically, if I were hand watering, and let's say I had an established landscape and it had not rained, and I had just planted this Cranberry Creek boxwood, which by the way, I just ordered two more of these. I am obsessed with these. Oh, that's the one. Huh? This is the one. And in fact, um, when I looked online, when somebody was giving it a review, they even mentioned uh, Linda Vada, that Linda Vada recommended it. They could improve their packaging when they ship these to you, but nevertheless, oh my goodness, they are, they are just an unbelievable deal. But I digress. Back to the point I was making. Let's say I had this was an established landscape and I had just planted this here 
and it had not been raining a lot. In that case, I would want to make sure that I, as I was watering my pots on a daily basis, that I also gave these newly planted specimens additional water until they get established. Pretty much anything that you plant in your landscape, if it is new to your landscape and it is summer and it is this hot, then you are gonna to wanna to make sure that you really, really keep them hydrated, not just like this, but again, down there at the root zone and be pretty generous about the, the amount of water that you give them. I typically do not water these Eugenias on a daily basis. I probably really water them well about once a week. Yes, do you have a question? Well, I have a question that uh -huh. maybe other people are thinking, and that is how easy, is it, this might be the right way to ask it, how easy is it to overwater? <laughs> Um, it can be very easy to overwater. <laughs> I imagine people are, are like myself were afraid of that when I yes. had a garden. Yes, okay. So this time of year, unless you have really, really poor drainage in any of your pots or in the ground, it's kind of difficult to overwater. Now you don't want to overwater because obviously that's not water wise. It's not being a good steward of, of our resources. Um, but it's kind of difficult. A sign of overwatering is if your plants start turning, say, really yellow, that means you are leaching out a lot of the nutrients, you're leaching out a lot of the iron, and you might want to hold back on the watering. Sadly, some of the signs of overwatering are the same as underwatering. Wow. So, <laughs> so it is always beneficial to actually stick your finger into the soil you know, about an inch down and just test and kind of see, and then put on your common sense hat and say, okay, is this an area that is likely to get too much or too little water? Be a sleuth. Is there a sprinkler head that's right near it and something else is blocking it? And because of that, it's either getting too much or too little water. I think a lot of it is just know thy garden, know thy uh, thy geography and the, the, the context in which you are watering and growing things and that might that might help you sometimes if i'm just absolutely not sure and i just can't come up with any clues that give me a hint as to whether or not i am watering or overwatering, then sometimes i will just if it's in the heat of the summer, I will just give it a whole lot of water for a while and see if that starts to make a difference, if it puts out new growth and if it begins to recover. So sometimes watering is as much an art as it is a science. Let us take just a moment to breathe and admire these gorgeous Eugenias that are, by the way, set in the ground in the pots because this makes them more secure. They don't blow over. They actually stay hydrated longer. And I like the height at which they're growing. A lot of you have asked, now, what will you put in those holes um, in those holes when Good I question. take them into the greenhouse. Well, I could put in another potted plant in there that was an evergreen and that was cold hardy and would then be insulated by the surrounding soil. I could not put anything in there except for tulip bulbs for next Ooh. year. Ooh. Um, but I probably, I really like where I have placed them and I anticipate that I will want to place them in the same location next year. So in that event I will probably just plop in an evergreen another pot um, just something that will kind of be a placeholder you can use your imagination for that if nothing else I could just put gravel in there so that's that's kind of an option I could just put a pot in there and put gravel in the pot and just remove the pot and then plop that specimen back in place next spring the t you like the tulip idea? Well, believe me, there will be plenty of places for tulips. And I, I, next week, I'm going to be talking to my pal at Color Blends, and we're going to decide on the color palette for spring next year. So stay tuned to that. Some of you had asked, okay, 
there had been a dead boxwood in here. Was it really sincerely dead? Most sincerely dead. Yes, it was. You can see that in here I also have drip irrigation and I am going to do a hopscotch with my boxwoods. So I'm going to put a larger boxwood in place here. I might even plant this one in here, put the smaller one in there. Anyhow, there's going oh, to be, uh, yeah, yeah uh, well, it doesn't matter. I'll show that next week. But there's going to be lots of stealing from Peter to pay Paul. Let's just put it that way. But I don't necessarily want to buy any new plants for this, I can easily just kind of move them around. And I say easily, not so easily when it's this hot, but it can be done without the purchase of any new plants. And because all of my soil has just recently been amended um, and the, the beds established, it's pretty easy digging. So that was, that was one of the ones that I dug up and took from the old house. So the fact that it didn't make it is not too surprising. But look at this guy back here. This guy back here did make it. Pretty happy. And there's a big old weed coming up right in the middle. Which then is a good transition to my window box, which I just, I know some of you were skeptical, but I promise even even I did not think it would turn out this beautiful. And even I did not think that these plants would be able to handle this exposure as well as they have. But I just, I love the way it looks. I love the fact that yes, it is both a mini elegant and edible landscape. And by the way, if you guys haven't listened to it, um, along with Jennifer Jewell, I did a podcast on cultivating place uh, on an NPR station or PBS station, and we had such a good conversation, and she was asking me what constitutes an elegant and edible garden. So to get that answer then, you probably want to listen to that. So good I... Tease. Good tease. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And I, 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 I want to go listen to it now. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> And Jennifer does such a great job just in general with her podcast. You want to make sure to listen to her podcast. And, oh, yes, absolutely. We will put a link. If we don't, you guys will, will say, Linda, you didn't put a link. Um, this window box, I fertilize. I just knocked something over. Um, I fertilize very heavily because this I water every single day, even though it has dedicated drip lines to it. Because of its expanse, sometimes the ends don't get as much moisture as they should. And I really, really water this a lot. But I am so rewarded by this, by all of these fun sun gold tomatoes. And won't they be fun when they're suspended up here? It's almost even climbing along the cottage wall. Won't that be fun when those turn into, oh, yeah. into tomatoes? And look at all these peppers. I mean, look at all of those peppers. I know I've showed them to you before, but I'm such a proud mama, I have to show you them again. Well, these are new peppers, so they're different. Yeah, these are new peppers. <laughs> yes, it's a different garden every day. That's right. It is a different garden every single day. Um, the pot I have to water the most is this scaviola right here. I don't know why. It's probably because if you'll notice, it's a, about the size of the urns. It's a little bit smaller. And because of that, I do have to water it every day. I do not necessarily, yeah, isn't it gorgeous? Yeah, I couldn't see it until I got down. And it's such a heat lover. So it just keeps pumping out these gorgeous, it's also called fan flower, and it just keeps pumping out these blooms over and over again. And they just then, I think, harmonize beautifully with the scaviola that's in the window box. And by the way, I have not really pointed it out enough, but here is one of those gorgeous chef's choice rosemary. You'd be smelling here. it if you were here. Oh my gosh, then it is just lovely. And okay, while we're over here, let's admire all of these peppers because aren't they while so fun? While we're here, <laughs> let us appreciate the peppers and the wild tomatoes. If the tomatoes were really buggy, 
um, any foliage that is really buggy, all I have to do is just remove it or remove that cane. If it's getting too heavy and it is covering something else up, I can just remove it. I don't let my plants boss me. And I am constantly pinching out things in the interior. So I want this pineapple guava to really thicken up. So I am really pinching out. See, let's Tell do that again. Pinched, I'm, good. Yeah, I'm pinching right here in between the two leaves and I'm pinching right there. And what's it gonna do? And it is going to make it bushier. It's going to thicken it up. You can see that when I first, if you go back and watch some of the initial planting videos that we did, you'll notice that this was rather tall and spindly, but because of my constant pitch, pinching, it is uh, really thickening up, getting more bushy, and it is calling attention to its gorgeous gray foliage. Even right now, if I'm sacrificing some flowers on it and some baby guava on it, I don't care because right now I'm growing it primarily for its foliage. And then these over here, like these large boxwoods, uh, these large boxwoods, I don't typically water these every day. I don't have to water them every day. I am now because it's also prime spider mite season. And the first line of attack for spider mite is just physical removal. And you can do that. You can do that with water. The other thing is, did you hear them just go, ah, <laughs> because it's already getting hot out. Look at these. On, oh, dang it. Right, what was that? The butterfly. It was pretty. Oh, butterfly. It flew away. A butterfly intervention mm -hmm. um, interruption these down here these are some of those foxglove I was telling you about Gail if you're watching this Gail is my buddy up in Enid gardener extraordinaire that gifted me with all of the Cleome and the Celosia seeds and I'm saving lots of seed and foxglove starts for her absolutely incredible cottage garden this scented geranium from my friend Monica. We need to get Monica yes. back on. We haven't seen, she moved too. So we've all been busy. But I do water this every day. And then let's, let's look at how much more full this Eugenia is than it was last time. Which is why you guys need to watch oh, every, wow. every episode. I know. It didn't even look like balls so, so I know. Much. Now it does. Yeah, now it really does because of lots of water, lots of fertilizing, and frequent pinching. pinching. Now you will ask, <laughs> I, well, I was gonna say, I was gonna tell you what I use to fertilize, but you know what, I'll just leave that as a tease because I think we're gonna talk about that next week. Mm -hmm. So I just keep pinching this, and before you know it, these spheres will be every bit as large as the other ones. Um, I happen to know that there are a couple of plants that are not getting the sprinkler system attention they deserve. Those two moon dance hydrangeas from Southern Living Plants oh, on the end. Is. And so I am going to probably adjust my sprinkler heads so that they too get as much attention. And while you're over there, Stuart, look at the new oh, yeah. concrete pad that I have there that they haven't put the sealer on it yet but that was previously cracked and in short order it it will begin to as it ages it will begin to match the rest of it but it is no longer treacherous at least from the crack in the sidewalk no stand boy <laughs> well there's always treacherousness is that a word Probably not. Well, we just made one up. Okay, let's go out here. The other thing I like about this, it doesn't seem to catch on things as much. And because of kind of its slickness and maybe because it's more narrow. Um, and by the way, this is not a sponsored post. I just love this hose. 
Um, if I have recently seeded some, let's say, some more boxwood basil seeds, or I am establishing some little cuttings or clippings. You just made me have to give them a, a, few, a few seconds of just the basil. Of just the boxwood basil, because it is just a diminutive little darling, and I do love it, and it is probably one of my very favorite things of this season. And you may recall, I think we showed everyone, after a rain, I pinched a stem and I stuck it in the ground and look. Whoa. It is already turning into little baby plants. There's another one back there. And these, I also give an extra dose of water. So you do, you not only have to be conscientious about your watering, you also have to have a good memory. <laughs> for where you put something. This guy over here, I do not water this every day because this is a perfect example of a massive pot with a topiary in it. And you may say, well, how are you going to put that one into the greenhouse? Because it's in a heavy concrete pot and I have it a really, really large plastic pot in the back that I have saved for just such a purpose so that it can then more easily be taken to, uh, to the greenhouse. Now, Stuart, this is a good point, a, a good place for us to remind everyone of one of our, I think, one of our most popular videos, and that is many things you can do with plastic, large plastic black nursery pots mm -hmm. that we did at the other house. Can we find that link? Probably. And by the way, if we forget to put the link, you guys let me know and we will add it somewhere. Um, and then also, just because my roses were planted later, because they are on an incline facing south, a lot of times I will give them in the morning where there is plenty of time for them to dry off, the foliage to dry off, because typically you do not want to overspray you want to water roses at the base, but because I also want to knock off any pests and because there's adequate time and sun for the foliage to dry off and, and not become a victim to black spot, then I give these a little bit of additional water and you will notice that I have been rewarded even in this heat with some new growth. Because again, these were not planted until a little bit later, so they're getting established. They're, they're still in the process. Well, everything is in the process. Always. Always. And yes, those of you who say, Linda, I see some Bermuda grass coming up in there. I am on it. <laughs> and that's the other thing, when you're out here doing this, which by the way, I find to be relaxing and quite pleasant work. Those are the things I look for. I look for any plants that seem to be distressed, that seem to oh, maybe be buggy, that might need pruning. I am looking for all of those things as I water them. Another question, since this is about Q&A today, someone was asking me, will I leave this brick in place along the steps. Indeed, I will, because I like the way it looks. And it's holding in the soil. And pretty soon, as these boxwood gets, boxwoods get larger, obviously, you won't see as much of the brick, but there will be a hint of the brick. And I like that. Um, and yes, I do have some washout down there. You'll notice that I do not have washout on this side. I do have washout on this side. So then I ask myself, I put on my Sherlock Holmes hat and I said, why? Let me look for clues. Why would that be the case? Well, look over here. What a, per what a perfect opportunity that was to say your Carmen San Diego hat. Oh, in my Carmen San Diego? Because they all look like Carmen San Diego when you put them on. All right, oh, sorry. Do they? I'm okay. I'm done interjecting. Okay, so look here. <laughs> 
Sometimes you guys say, oh, I just ignore what Stuart says. Well, it's because I'm concentrating on what I'm saying and I'm paying attention to my garden, not always to Stuart. Oh. Sorry, sorry, Stuart, oh. you know I love you. Um, but notice in here, there's only about a quarter to a half an inch gap. See right in here, there's only about a quarter to a half an inch gap. And over here it's considerably different. Huh? And considerably wider over here. So what I need to do then is I need to move these bricks closer to the steps. See, look here. This is not washed out. This is washed out. That's the difference that a half an inch can make. So that's an easy fix when I get around to it. <laughs> I'll add that. I will add that to, to my list of things to do. If I see that any of these are struggling, I will give them an extra drink. And it's also, by the way, so helpful to have a hose and sprayer that is easy to use, especially if you have problems with hand strength or you've got some arthritis. I'm starting to get a little arthritis in here because this thumb maneuver is just so easy. See? I don't have to constantly press. I don't have to push a button. I don't have to do anything. And by the way, all, all uh, spray heads are not equal. Sometimes it really requires a lot of effort to push that up. You want to make sure that there's one that glides pretty easily. These are things that, these are things that I have noticed over time. Okay, so Stuart, I think we need to take a break here. We've probably already kind of taken a break, but let's, let's take another one before I answer another question, that overarching question so many of you had up front related to my, my self-seeding flowers. I am doing very light pruning on some of my topiaries today, which will lead us into our first question, because Leah is going to read out some of the ones that you've asked me this past week, and I'm gonna hopefully try to answer them. So Leah, go for it. Yes, so while we're here with the topiary, Lori Smith, wants to know, why do you not plant anything around the topiaries in the pots? Okay, well, Lori Smith, this is a request. When you guys ask me questions, tell me where you're from, because I think that it will be fun, fun to say Lori Smith from wherever Lori is from. Um, I sometimes do, and I have in the past, but increasingly I find that I like to keep them just with nothing but mulch on the bottom. And that's for a number of different reasons. One, because I think it makes the topiary itself look a little less busy, a little more pure in terms of being able to see the architecture of the branching of the trunk. And it makes them seem a little bit more statuesque and taller. The other reason I don't is because then I not only have to tend and trim the topiary, but I have to tend and trim sometimes what I think are over aggressive uh, an over aggressive skirt that might be around the base now I have done it I periodically do it in some cases and I think I talked about this in the last Wednesday walkabout sometimes things will go to seed in it and in this case this Eugenia that I'm pruning very lightly on has some columbine that has gone to seed at the base of it not so much because I really want it to grow and bloom here, but because it went to seed and then later I can transplant it someplace else. So that's kind of my thinking. I am not an absolutist on it. I sometimes do and I sometimes don't, uh, but increasingly I find I like it to look you know, just a little bit simpler. Okay, okay, Leah, what's my next question? Susan Mason wants to know what are your thoughts on using shade cloth to protect some of your plants during the heat of the day well if you have followed me for any length of time or at least for a year you know that last year at this very same time temperatures got up to as high as 115 here in oklahoma city and over the potage so i wouldn't lose it Stuart, we might need to put up a picture right here 
I put up some huge uh, expanses of shade sail cloth and I just secured them to the sides of the house and to some posts that we that we put up. I have not had to do that here yet because our temperatures haven't been quite that extreme and we've had so much rain. But in anticipation that I might have to do that later in the month, I did get some shade sail cloth. We'll put a link below that I can put up in the event that temperatures really just go off of the chart. This, this time I got it in gray and I would probably, if, if you guys watched me last year trying to put this into place, it was just a comedy of errors. So this year I'd probably have somebody help me put it up. This is 14 by 14. Um, you, if you're going to try it yourself, just measure you know, the dimensions because the shade sail comes in so many different sizes that you can pretty much get a custom fit ceiling, if you will, for your own space. So yes, I do. Periodically, if it's a really prized specimen, for example, I've got a friend who came to visit yesterday and she was telling me that she put up some shade sail cloth or maybe maybe even just a large garden umbrella over her Japanese maple because she didn't want it to fry. So you can use them in a very targeted way or you can use them like I did last year as a broad expanse to just put a big cover over the garden itself. Right now, all of these seem to be thriving. I'm not too worried about it, but I'll definitely be a attentive if in the future it would also appreciate a little bit of respite from the sun and the heat. Okay you guys, get your iced tea, get your coffee, get your beverage of choice and come meet me up on the social patio because apparently you have some more questions for me. <laughs> yes, we have just a couple fun questions okay. now. First one, uh, Charlene is wondering if the people that you bought the house from have been back to see what you have done and if oh. they have any questions or comments oh. about it. I think I talked about this when we first moved into the cottage, but the, the cottage previously, its former owner was actually an, an older woman who lived here a number of years ago and she was I think in her 90s and uh, they there were two people that I do, I do know, I found out that I did know them um, when I came to a house showing, an open house, and they bought the house from this woman basically to flip. And so they completely redid the entirety of the inside so they knew what had been done. But interestingly, I'm not sure about the older woman. I don't, I don't know if she's even still alive. I think she may have passed. Uh, but the two women who flipped the house, interestingly, I have run into them at different events. I think uh, one of them was at a garden club. One of them was at an art show. And they were all over and they drive by periodically to look at the gardens and they already knew what I was going to do. They kind of knew what my shtick was, that I was a garden designer. So they have been thrilled and I and hopefully they have enjoyed the process. But they, they were well aware of what was the changes that were made on the inside, at least, um, at least in terms of, you know, the walls and the flooring and all that because they did it themselves. Okay, this person says, come on, Linda, you must listen to some oldies rock and roll. I'm your age and like to crank the volume once in a while. I'm a huge Queen fan and picked out some music to be played at my funeral. So tell us about uh, your okay, music. Okay. So I'll share if you'll share. You guys make sure to put what you listen to below. I, I, well, Stuart knows that I always, I don't watch a lot of TV, so I always have music going though I wouldn't say that I'm any kind of music connoisseur. That would be for Stuart and Leah. Uh, okay, obviously, the, the no-brainer answer is I love the Beatles, and so I listen to the Beatles. I listen to uh, Phil Collins. I was once asked out by <laughs> Phil Collins, uh, somebody who worked for Phil Collins. Oh, he was a, he was a friend of a friend of mine <laughs> in Dallas. Cool. Yeah, I know. Who knew? <laughs> uh, let's see. I, I love... Um, I don't know if he's rock and roll, but I love Leonard Cohen. Oh, yeah. I, I love, uh, Katie Lang, I guess, isn't really rock and roll. Oh, roll. I love Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, Billy Joel. 
Uh, come on, we need to throw some Elvis. women in there. Oh, women. Uh, we only so, yeah, women. some gals. Oh, Stevie oh. Nicks. Oh yeah, Stevie Nicks. Oh, Stevie Nicks. Wow. Yeah. See, that's that's the music. Some of that that I want to play at my funeral. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, Stevie Nicks. Love love her. Um, and what do I actually listen to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I listen to all of those. I I love. I listen um, frequently. I love to listen to the Johnny Cash radio wow. on Pandora. I love Patsy Cline. I love, um, I listen to lots of piano music. I love uh, Cloud DBC. I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation. I love relaxing piano music. There's always piano music. There's on always when you piano. Walk into Linda's uh, yeah, house. Yes, there always is. It's what I. It's what I work by. I love meditative spa mm -hmm. music. Sometimes I like to listen to stuff like Gregorian chants. Mm. Uh, what other music do I listen to? You guys are at my house folk. all the time. Yeah, I love Celtic music. Love. Um, I love Mumford and Sons. Um, Black Eyed Peas, who else do I, I love? love. Um, Clan. Yeah, and then sometimes there's music that I don't even know who they are. Mm -hmm. I just I just like them. Just and the yes, you yeah, like and, the and periodically I, I, okay, so as long as we're being vulnerable and sharing, if you would have been at my house on the 4th of July, <laughs> I put on the soundtrack to Hamilton, Love. and I was just dancing around in my kitchen That's to good. the soundtrack so of good. Hamilton. I loved it. I love. I love to put on Broadway Me tunes. Too. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I will listen to pretty much anything. I, I guess I'm not into heavy metal too much, um, but I, anyhow, I, I, I love it all. It really depends on, on my mood. But, but hell yeah, hell yeah, I do listen to other things <laughs> besides piano music. There's the answer to that question. You guys share. Share your favorite tunes and some of your favorite uh, Spotify stations and things yes. like that. Make sure to share that below. Okay, Linda, last question is from me. Where um, is that cute apron dress from? Because okay, I okay. know people are going to be yeah, asking. Yeah, going to ask. Okay. So I'm a gal that periodically likes to dress like, I don't know, what would I call this, a farm girl? Yeah. or whatever because especially when it's 115 degrees out when it's very very hot Cottage. and I like aprons you guys know that I like aprons work aprons and isn't this one cute Leah I love it isn't this cute it's got this eyelet or what, what do you call that mm -hmm. cut out eyelet work on it and it, it has pockets you know cute. it has pockets so so I like it and then you guys also, if you followed for any length of time, I don't know if you know this about me, Leah, but I love house dresses. Love. And so this is just a house dress that you guys probably recognize if you've watched me for any length of time because uh, I like to wear these. To me, these are the liminal kind of clothing that you put on. After you've worked out, you're not really gonna be going out. Mm -hmm. You're just gonna be in the house and you don't necessarily wanna be in your workout clothes or your leggings or whatever. Right. Um, so this is just loose, comfortable, very practical attire, attire for uh, anyone who is the Shadowlin of their own home. I love it. Well, I am no doubt starting to glisten because it's very humid out here. A lot of you, have expressed concern, so this is kind of like a collective question where I'm answering them all, about, oh my goodness, you are going to really regret all of these self-seeders when they go to seed if you don't deadhead all of them and they self-seed in place. Well, I was discussing this with our buddy Roger yesterday and he said, first of all, his philosophy was, I would much rather just edit out things that had gone to seed by just sloughing them off at the surface than I would by having to get them reestablished from year to year. The other thing is, if you don't let some of them go to seed and do their thang, then you prevent surprises from the best designer of all, Mother Nature. So originally I thought that I had just dedicated, for example, this Cleome just to this spot right here. But apparently I had also sprinkled some <laughs> over there by Anne 
because they came up over there too. And I think the beauty of my garden would not nearly be as magnificent if this Cleome and its fun waving heads didn't extend over there to the east and kind of surrounding the patio. So the other thing is a lot of the seed that will drop, um, it will drop and then eventually be covered up by some of the perennials and things that are growing around it. For example, this sunshine ligustrum, which will shade them out and make them less vigorous which will make them easier to pull out or they will not germinate at all. So I then asked my friend Gail, who gifted me with all of this seed, what she does, and hers is a massive cottage garden in the back. She pretty much just lets hers go to seed. And I am going to do, since I am not an absolutist to any extreme, I will probably do some judicious deadheading and I will also let some of it scamper. Now, I will probably get lots of you who think differently, um, but that's where I say, you do you and I'll do me. And if it is an onerous task for you to remove lots of seedlings later, then by all means, deadhead them. But I don't want to deadhead these right now, even though some of the seed heads are drying because they just look so gorgeous. And, it's, and it breaks my heart. So, and the pollinators just adore them. It's very busy up here on the upper terrace. Well, here is the in-process reveal of the back steps that I promised to show you. There's more work to be done on them, but I think you really have an idea of what they are going to be like when they are absolutely finished. We're gonna face them in brick. The risers will, uh, will be brick, and I don't know, I just think they're pretty spectacular, <laughs> and they're not even finished yet. And I told Hubs, I said, oh, these are so much easier to get up and down because the, the rise is so much shorter. And he said, oh, and I can already see them with lots of pots in my way. <laughs> So uh, there will be a bit of both, easier passage, lots of pots, and I can't wait for you guys, and actually I can't wait for myself to see them when they are completely finished, as I think probably a pretty breathtaking focal point to the backyard from every direction, whichever way you come in. And yes, do I, do I kind of feel a little bit like Scarlett O'Hara coming down the staircase? Yes, I do. You guys have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.